Hey guys, it's Brooke with Super Tutor TV, and today we are going to talk about three math hacks for the SAT math section. If you haven't already done it, I just want to encourage everybody out there to subscribe to our channel. All you have to do is click the subscribe button. It's really awesome. Go do it. And then the other thing I want to encourage you to do is head over to our website, supertutortv.com. We have a blog and lots of other videos and blog posts and awesome information for you guys, even some free resources. We have links to all the free SAT tests and the free SAT book from the College Board and all that good stuff. So go over to supertutortv.com, check out those resources, subscribe to our mailing list while you're there, and let's get started with the video. So in terms of math hacks for the SAT, what these are is these are some sort of backdoor tricks that you can use to solve problems on the test. Sometimes they're going to save you time, other times they're actually going to be way more time consuming than the straightforward way to do the problem, but they're always really great problem solving tools because if you get stuck or you can't see it from another angle, these are going to help you hack into those problems and still be able to get to an answer choice and finish the test and hopefully get a super awesome score. Cool. So let's get into it. My first hack is to use the answers. And I know this is a tip that a lot of tutors have probably given you, but I'm going to show you one way in particular that I use it on this particular test because of the nature of this test. This test is a little bit different from the old SAT and even the ACT in the sense that one, the math section only has four answer choices. And a lot of the time those answer choices have a lot of repetition going on in them. So when you see that repetition, that's a huge opportunity for speeding up. So I'm going to get into a problem right now. What I like to do with this particular trick is I like to save time, especially on the no calculator permitted section on there's usually a couple of questions where I can basically not necessarily do the problem all the way through, but look at the answer choices and sort of cheat my way to a faster endpoint. Okay. So here's one problem where that's true. If y equals x cubed plus 2x plus 5 and z equals x squared plus 7x plus 1, what is 2y plus z in terms of x? As you can see, what we've got going on here is we've got two equations and then we have what's called an expression here. I call these equation expression questions. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use substitution. I'm going to plug in my Z. I'm going to plug in my Y into this expression. So this is a lot of adding. It's just combining. There's some foil, but I don't want to waste time. So I'm going to be a little smart and I'm going to look over here. Whenever I'm combining terms, usually the easiest terms to combine are the first terms and the last terms. So those are what I'm going to look at first. I see that this is unique here, and then these are all the same. Do you see that repetition? And then over here, all of these are distinct except for the two 11s. You see that? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go after, let's go after this column first because I think that one's usually really easy to get is like my no variable section. And so the way I get that is 2 times 5 is 10 right? If I use the distributive property and then I'm going to add that 10 to the one over here. So that gives me 11, but you see how I'm not actually combining all my terms. I'm just being lazy and combining my last term and using process of elimination. So that gets rid of B and D because I know 10 plus one is 11. Boom. And now remember that first term, that first term is probably going to be pretty easy to solve out too. This is X cubed, right? This is X squared. Huh? So this has no X cubes at all. So my only X cubes are just these over here, which is going to be two times that, which is two X cubed. Okay, so I need two X cubed to see, and I'm done. Boom. You see how I skipped the middle of my foil? What I usually do on these questions is I put a big star and I put a little note for myself to double check it because I know that I skipped the middle terms. So then when I get done with the whole test, I'll come back to this one and then I will foil everything out and I'll be super careful. But in order to pick up time on this no calculator section, I try to find as many of these problems as possible where I have these answer choices where there's repetition. And when I see that repetition, I can use that to my advantage to speed up my process, use process of elimination and kind of like dice through to the answer. Cool. So my next math hack is another classic tutor hack, which is make up numbers. When you don't know how to do a problem, or even if you do know how to do a problem, a lot of times a way to build clarity or a way to figure out how all those numbers work together is to make up hypothetical numbers and plug those into the situation so that you can kind of play with things and know how everything is set up. This works particularly well whenever you have variables in the answer choices. So here's how this goes. The gas mileage for Peter's car is 21 miles per gallon when the car travels at an average speed of 50 miles per hour. Okay. The car's gas tank has 17 gallons of gas at the beginning of a trip. If his car travels an average of 50 miles an hour, which of the following functions models the number of gallons of gas remaining in the tank T? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make up a T. I'm going to pretend that Peter drives, let's say, 
for two hours, okay? And then I'm gonna manually calculate all this stuff out. FYI, I don't like to make up one when I'm making up numbers and I have variables in the answer choice because one disappears really easily and sometimes that disappearing act means that more than one answer choice is right. So I'm gonna make up two. If he goes for two hours and he's going 50 miles an hour, that means he's gonna go 100 miles, right? And if he drives for 100 miles, then I'm gonna figure out how much gas did he use? Well, if he's using 21 miles uh, uh, per gallon, the first 21 miles of his trip, he's gonna use one gallon. The next 21, so we're up to 42, he's gonna use two gallons, right? The next 21, so we're up to 63 gallons, he's gonna use three. 84, he's gonna use four. So it's a little over four, but how do I get that? What am I doing? Oh, I'm dividing 100 miles by 21 miles per gallon, right? And I'm putting one over 21 miles per gallon. And that's actually 20, one gallon over 21 miles, I can also think of it as. Remember, whenever we have a unit, if I have 21 miles per gallon, what that is is 21 miles over one gallon. And I can also think of it as flipped, one gallon over 21 miles, if I want to. In any case, what I'm doing is dividing 100 by 21. We've got 100 divided by 21 gallons that I've used up. I'm not gonna do the math on that, I'm just gonna leave it put. And when you've got ugly stuff here, don't solve it down, just leave it put because we're gonna try to go backwards in a second. So to find the number of gallons left in the tank, I'm gonna take the 17 gallons, I'm gonna subtract the stuff that I've used, right? This stuff right here. So this is what I'm looking for, this is my answer. That's the amount of gas remaining. Well, now I'm gonna go back and figure out how the heck did I get 100? Well, 100 was this 50 miles per hour times the T, right? This is actually just 50 T. So I'm gonna try to piece this out and where it came from, and there it is. See, this is 50 T, that's 100, right? There's my 21 and there's my 17. So my answer is B. So really classic trick, but it's super helpful when you get a confusing sounding word problem like this and you've got all these variables in the answer choice. It's a great problem solving technique. Everybody should know it, okay? And finally, my third tip is a little bit unique to this test. This one's a little more unique than those last two. And that is the idea of plug in zero or one, when in doubt, especially when you have quadratics or exponential functions, okay? So when we get these problems and you don't quite know what to do with them, if you plug in zero or one, it can help you kind of eliminate answer choices and get down to what things mean and, and better understand things. So we're gonna take a look at how it works right here. A biology class at Central High School predicted that a local population of animals will double in size every 12 years. The population at the beginning of 2014, so in 2014, it was estimated to be 50 animals. So if I know this, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step out one generation. So I'm saying plug in one or zero. I also, with this exponentially kind of stuff, and I know this is exponential because I'm experienced with this, but even if you don't, step forward one generation. So if I add 12 years, then that's 2026. And then in 2026, I'm gonna have 100 animals, right? So the P, P represents the population N years after 2014. So here, N actually equals 12, not one, but that's okay then which of the following equations represents the class's model of the population over time? So I know a few things here. I know when n equals 12, p equals 100. I also know when n equals zero, p equals 50, okay? So this is my plug in zero. Remember my plug in zero tip? So my plug in zero tip comes down to if I go nowhere, if I start my starting place, I know the population starts at 50 animals, so when n equals 50, zero years from 2014, I know p equals 50. What this plug-in one or zero enables me to do is it enables me to get a couple of points that I can then back solve and plug into the stuff that I have over here, use process of elimination and come up with the answer. So here I'm gonna plug in n equals zero, p equals 50. When n equals zero here, p equals 12. That just goes away, that's not right. Here, when n equals zero, p equals 50, that works. Here, when n equals zero, this two to the zero becomes one, and that's 50, so that works, and then this works as well because that's in the exponent, so the zero, this all becomes one, it goes away, and we get 50. So we only got rid of one answer choice from the zero, but still, it can be useful, and on some problems, you're gonna get rid of more than one answer. And now let's actually, I'm gonna go to this n equals 12. Yes, it's not plugging in one, but it's one generation, which is kind of the same idea. So we're gonna say 100 equals 50, plus 12 times 12. No, that's not true, because that's 144. Now let's look at this, two to the 12 N. Well, if N is 12, holy cow, that's two to the 144th. That is one ginormous number, and I don't know what it is, but it's definitely not just two. And then down here, D, so I know D has to be right. And again, I could plug in N equals one, I could plug in N equals zero, I could plug in N equals 12. So that's just plug in zero or one, or step forward sort of one generation, 
in these exponential problems, you're going to be able to wrap your head around them pretty easily, even if you're getting confused as to how to set it up. I want to reiterate that this is one way to do problems, and these are like backdoor tricks to do the problems. Are they always the fastest way? Sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. But above all, what I always like to say is you want to have more tools in your toolbox. So I want to teach you guys some unconventional ways to do problems so that you're just better prepared for this test and you never feel like there's nothing you can do to try to solve something that might seem complicated or a little hard to crack. So I hope you guys like this video. Subscribe to our channel. Go check out all of our social media, our Facebook, our Instagram, all that fun stuff. Subscribe to our mailing list at supertutortv.com. And I will see all of you guys next week on Super Tutor TV. In the meantime, watch some more videos and good luck on your SAT. Bye, everybody.